Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I hope you are all well fed and uh, looking forward to the afternoon sessions. Uh, my name is Jujana Veg. I'm uh, one of the vice chairs of the Hungarian Europe Society. Uh, I would also like to thank you all for uh, joining us today. Uh, we will be uh, continuing today's conference with a very uh, interesting panel. Maybe moving away a little bit from the political communication domain, uh, we will be talking about uh, challenges journalism faces in today's environment, both in terms of political challenges, technological challenges, as well as business challenges. Uh, we have three very distinguished speakers on the panel today. Uh, on my um, far right, so for the expression, we have Mr. Uh, John Boyd, uh, who is founding member and senior research fellow at the Reuters Institute uh, for the Study of Journalism at the University of Oxford. He is also a contributing editor to the Financial Times. Uh, right next to me on the right is uh, Ms. Anna Silegi. She is a professor of communications at the Savannah College of Art and Design in Hong Kong. She is also the founder of the Talk Decoded blog as well as uh, the Words Break uh, Bones Education Program. And finally, last but not least, uh, on my left uh, is Elodie uh, Vial. She is the Head of Journalism and uh, Technology uh, Program at the organization Reporters Without Borders, uh, which I'm sure you all know. Uh, so she will combine for us uh, technology and journalism in today's panel. Uh, to begin with and to sort of set the scene, uh, have a broader picture, uh, we would start uh, the panel with uh, Mr. Lloyd, who will give us an idea about um, how technology in the internet, social media impacts journalism, how it changes its quality, um, and uh, he will talk a little bit about this uh, sort of ongoing transformation today. So without further ado, I would uh, give the floor to Mr. Lloyd. Uh, and you will have around, yeah, you will have 12 minutes and you have the mic. Uh, thanks very much. Um, uh, as you said, I want to talk mainly about net effects, effects of the web and so on, journalism. And I called what I'm saying in the uh, letter I sent to the, uh, the organizers of this really stimulating conversation today that it was to be called the end of journalism. And of course, like most headlines, it doesn't mean what the story will say. It's, uh, it's an attempt to attract attention. Um, but I wanted to go into what journalism is becoming uh, in, in the net era. It, everyone says that, that the effects of the net are just at the beginning. Who knows? They may be halfway through. Um, but they're certainly still developing. And for journalism, uh, the effects have been quite dramatic. The most dramatic has been, uh, and if you like, tragic, has been in my neck of the woods, which is newspapers, where I've been for most of my working life. And there, the business model of newspapers, really everywhere, uh, uh, has, been un has been cut, uh, cut by advertising, migrating to uh, Google and Facebook, um, and cut also by the use of the net, instead of buying your daily copy of whatever it might be that you bought before. Many newspapers continue to survive, including my own, the Financial Times, the FT and Economist and other business papers continue to survive because they have niches. They have niches of um, people who need their, uh, their information or <coughs> like to be seen, to be reading them, and, uh, uh, and thus are willing to pay uh, a high price for them, uh, or very often on their expenses. Um, but it hasn't meant that news and opinion has suffered in that way, because news and opinion are now separated from newspapers, and indeed to a degree at least from, from television channels. Um, uh, it, it's created a, um, an ecology in which journalism, as we understand it, especially that journalism which might, one might call Anglo-Saxon journalism, the kind of journalism which 
especially after the war, I think America was, and to a degree also Britain, BBC was very active in uh, developing, which was that in a democracy, the uh, journalism was a pillar of democracy, and if it were a pillar of democracy, then it had to be um, neutral, balanced, objective, fair. In other words, it had to tell the truth or strive to tell the truth. Uh, and that, of course, still survives, um, and survives, I have to say, in some ways gloriously in the United States, where uh, the big newspapers and some of the TV channels um, are taking it upon themselves to the hard duty of separating fact from fiction in the presidential administration and in politics generally, which has been made more difficult for them, more difficult because so much of it is, seems to be false or, or can be shown to be false, but also more difficult because, as the editor of the Washington Post said when he gave a speech at Oxford a few couple of months ago, these papers don't want to be a permanent opposition. They don't see it. Uh, they, they are liberal, Post and, and the Times and others uh, as well, but they don't want always to be in opposition to the president. They want to uh, judge the president on the basis of his merits. The trouble is they see few merits and they see lots of lies and so they are now put into, as the president himself says, into a box of permanent opposition. Um, but they're doing so because they are striving to tell the truth. They no doubt get it wrong, as newspapers and journalists usually do because of speed and carelessness, but they do strive still to live up to their billing, what has been the billing for some, some decades. So it's the, what I meant by the, what I mean by the end of journalism is three major things. One, as I've said, it's part of an ecology, it's part of a whole stream of information which we as, uh, as consumers of information, consumers of news and opinion, can download, can look at at any time from the web. And journalism takes its place in that, sometimes a large place when it's breaking a big story, like say the Panama Papers or whatever, sometimes a much smaller one, and it's competing with information from a whole variety of other sources, from NGOs, from political parties, from governments, from universities, from think tanks, from members of the public for that matter, uh, which compete for space on the net uh, and to a degree the net confers upon them all a kind of an equality of, of being there, um, which is a problem as we've heard earlier this morning for, the, for those who put out fake news because most people find it difficult to discriminate between fake and real, but does mean that journalism of that kind that I defined earlier has to really fight for its, for its place and also, of course, fight for an income. Journal, uh, newspapers have now put up paywalls in many cases, uh, but paywalls reduce the circulation uh, quite sharply and, some, and very often don't bring in the same monetary rewards and financial rewards that advertising in the great boom days of newspapers, really the post-war period up to about 10, 15 years ago, uh, gave them. They're much poorer now, much thinner, uh, with fewer uh, foreign correspondents. As Wojciech said earlier this morning in a conversation with him, the great Gazette de Borcha, which was a product of Solidarność and the end of communism in, in Poland, uh, and was for a, for a long time the most popular paper in Poland, very uh, much admired both there and elsewhere. Uh, is now struggling for, for its future and has very few foreign correspondents. Indeed, he is it. Uh, uh, not, not quite, but, but, but almost. The second thing is that, the, that the, this, what I call the Anglo-Saxon approach to journalism uh, is now also under a good deal of, of pressure. Uh, the objective, fair, neutral, balanced idea which is in explicit in places like the BBC and in uh, I think New York Times also and various other uh, newspapers 
Um, it remains still, but it's under pressure. Uh, when I asked earlier this morning what difference is there between these news, uh, these broadcast <coughs> channels, which uh, broadcast from Russia mainly and from other Eastern sources, and Voice of America, BBC, Deutsche Welle, France 1, 4, and so on. What's the difference between them? Um, uh, the answer was partly that, you know, that they are much more tied into the state. They're paid for very often by the Ministry of Defense. They're seen explicitly as an instrument of, of warfare. But also, one should add that they are still trying to tell the truth. That, that, that the BBC, Deutsche Welle, France 1, 4, uh, and others, Voice of America does too. It's somewhat more um, polemical. But it also, it, as far as I know, it doesn't base its polemis, pole, polemics on anything but verifiable truth. Whereas, as we heard this morning, the, uh, the, the broadcast channels of the Kremlin and those close to it uh, actually wish to destroy the truth, or at least to so muddy the waters that the discrimination between truth and falsehood is, is increasingly difficult. And the, the final point, if I still have time, is, is that public relations has benefited enormously from, from, the, from the net. Uh, public relations began about 100 years ago or so, maybe a little longer now, actually, maybe 120, 130 years ago, mainly in the United States, and spread fairly quickly. And it began as a way of, of um, telling the public the merits of corporations, the government itself, institutions, and so on. And it was, from a very early stage, it was inventive, quite often funny, um, and you know, the people who did it were themselves considerable, had considerable imaginations and, uh, uh, and intellects. But for much of the time, this is to simplify, it, it remained um, a profession which put stuff into newspapers and TV channels. Uh, um, in other words, public relations people were in a sense always tugging at your sleeve saying, how about running this story, it's a great story, or this is a great guy and you should put him in the paper or on the TV. Uh, now, public relations has to a large degree overtaken uh, uh, journalism. In crude terms, it has, in, for both in America and in, in the United Kingdom, and I think many other countries as well, there are many more public relations people than there are journalists. Uh, and if you go to schools of journalism, uh, um, uh, very often you'll find that the, the, the students wish to be public relations people. It's better rewarded, you meet celebrities, uh, and you don't have to do the kind of the, the grunt work that journalism often gives you when you start out. That is assuming you can find a job, which is quite difficult, I think, now everywhere. But it's also because the narratives which we can put out travel faster, go further, go more broadly than they ever have before. And so uh, they're used much more, seen much more, seen much more quickly. And they have made, public relations people have seized on the point that, that corporations, governments, and institutions generally are much more transparent than they were before. And that's true. It doesn't mean to say you can see right through them, but it's more difficult to keep secrets. So many corporations have made a virtue of that and used public relations to say, we are transparent. You can see what we're doing. And to a degree, at least, that's true. It's not all phony. It's not all public relations. But it also means that they then have to be much more public. They have to be more political, if you will. They have to be more in the, in the arena of arguing their case. I met the other day, earlier this week, a man, CEO of an Italian company called Snam Progetti, which is building a huge gas pipeline. And it's held up, 75% finished, but held up at, in the last 25% by what the CEO called the NIMBYs, the not in my backyard. People who, are, who are people who say, I don't want this going through my street or going through my fields uh, um, and have the political power, political heft to stop it. Uh, and what he's saying is we then have to get into the political arena and argue the case that this gas pipeline is essential to keep 
a supply of gas going to Italian households, naturally beyond Italy, because it's building a hub which will go elsewhere. Otherwise, people will be cold. People will lose power. Uh, and um, so, so the public relations now are taking over the, the job of arguing, being uh, witnesses for their, for their own strategies in a way which they didn't before. And that, too, displaces journalism. I'll leave it there. Thanks. <clears throat>